We have Sonia here live and in person. And we're thrilled to be able to be sharing this with you guys tonight. So without further ado, I am going to go ahead and just turn things over to you, ma'am. Thank you. I'm really nervous. <laughs> it's been a while since I've talked to a big group of people. Um, when I started posting pictures on Facebook, a couple friends of mine said, well, why don't you put some circus pictures on? And I didn't think anybody would be interested. That was all so long ago. So I did post a few pictures, and I got a really great response from everybody. And the museum uh, were, were getting calls from people that they wanted to hear a program. So that's why I'm here tonight. Um, I'm overwhelmed by how many are here. Um, I was kind of afraid maybe there wouldn't be many people here. My daughter said, that's OK, Mom. The family's here. We'll do a wave and make them think the place is full. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I think um, I'm going to give you a little background of my circus history, not just me, uh, but so you understand where I'm coming from and what my family was about, how it got started. Actually, there was somebody performing in a circus or a fair for over 100 years from my family. Uh, it actually started in 1860 by this gentleman here. This is my great-grandfather. This is Wilhelm Frederick Lindemann. And um, he was a street performer in a little town outside of Hahn, Germany. And <clears throat> he also was a musician. He loved to play instruments. And he actually worked on a farm in Germany for five years for free uh, in exchange for music lessons so he could learn to play all these different musical instruments. Now, in Germany at this time, they had a Turner's organization. It was called the Turnverein. Does everybody know what the Turner's is? You know what the Sheboygan Turner's was. Well, this started uh, very early in Germany. And the reason for it was uh, it was like an athletic association. And they wanted their men to be uh, prepared and strong. Um, they didn't like the leadership at that time in Germany. So uh, the Germans decided that they, uh, they started an athletic association. They, their motto was strong mind, strong body. So my grand, a great grandfather was put through that. Now, as the years went on, he married uh, my great-grandma, and they had seven children. My grandpa was one of the seven, and this is my grandfather here, Pete. And um, there were four boys and three girls, uh, Pete, Bill, Al, and Carl. Three of the boys ended up uh, creating this circus. This is Sell Sterling Circus. This picture was actually taken on the lakefront in 1936 here in Sheboygan. That uh, was a very, very big show, and they employed almost 300 Sheboygan people. So it wasn't a, just a little thing. And most of the, uh, the canvas was bought here in Sheboygan. A lot of the trucks, the back, uh, backs of the trucks were made at Panzer Lumber Company. Um, so it was a very local, local thing. Uh, anyway, when my great-grandpa and my great-grandma came to Sheboygan, they uh, came around the turn of the century. And the boys, of course, were enrolled in Turner's right away. Uh, that was a German thing to do. And a Turner Hall, wherever the Germans settled, the Turner Halls went up. And that was a place for people that spoke German. They could talk with somebody in German. It didn't have to be English. They had all kinds of activities. But the main thing was strong mind, strong body. So all these kids learned to do all this athletic stuff. And they worked on pummel bars, and they worked on uh, juggling. They did all kinds of things. And of course, my grandfather and his brothers loved every minute of it. Well, my great grandpa had one of the first brass bands here in Sheboygan. And <clears throat> they would march uh, down Penn Avenue. Anybody know where the Old People's Theater was in Sheboygan? Anybody have an idea? It was on Penn Avenue, where Johnsonville Summer Sausage was. And in fact, part of the building is still there. And they often had vaudeville acts and entertainment there. But there were no street lights. So my grandpa, great grandpa, his band, my grandfather and his brothers, they held torches. And they walked with the band. They lit their way down the streets, down Penn Avenue, to the old people's theater. And um, <clears throat> so the band could see as they were going. Anyway, once they got to the theater, as a reward, they got to watch all the acts. 
Well, between Turner's and learning all the stuff um, or the things they watched at uh, People Theater, they had no, there was nothing else they wanted to do was to be circus performers. So they went home and they practiced. They taught themselves wire. They, taught, they could tumble. There really was very little they couldn't do. Now they both, my grandfather met my grandmother. She's from Manitowoc. Uh, Louise Stolson was her name, and they were doing some activity in Manitowoc with the circus, and he met her. She had never been in a circus before in her life. Uh, they got, fell in love, got married, and it was along, she was performing right along with him. Now, oh. Okay. Are we all right now? Yes. Yes. But as long as I'm up here, I'm going to move that just a little closer. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is my grandma, Louise. Um, this was a publicity picture taken in Chicago. Most of the acts went to Chicago to have professional pictures taken. Um, <clears throat> she had very long hair and always wore it up. She said it was hard performing with all that hair. Um, but this is actually them performing the Roman ring act. Now this is my grandma here, and she's holding up my, grandpa my grandfather and his cousin Ted. Now they're actually doing back plunges, which is a very, very hard trick to do. But grandma was pretty agile. She was pretty bendy. So that's, that's the act they started with. As the years went on, they had my father, and this is my dad here, Orville. Um, from little on, of course, he was on the circus, so he learned to do everything. But what he loved most was he was the man on the flying trapeze, the flying act. And at one time, he had 18-inch biceps. He was really, really in very good shape. But he learned to do everything on the show because his father owned the show. My grandpa was, I won't say cheap, but it was very frugal. So, <laughs> so, so <clears throat> he had uh, my dad learn almost everything. So my dad could put it up, take it down. He did 13 numbers in the show. And also on nights when the weather was bad, and, and on the circus you can kind of tell when there's a storm coming. You can tell by the way the animals are acting, and especially the elephants. Uh, if it's they, I don't know, they can feel something and you can see it all of a sudden they start moving a little bit and their ears are moving and you kind of know and the other animals are kind of pacing, you know something's coming. Well, my dad had to sit up all night, some nights, never got any sleep so he could warn if there was a bad uh, storm coming because that was a very dangerous thing for a tent circus in those years. Um, for a while they had their winter quarters here in Sheboygan, my uncle Al owned a uh, a small farm outside of Sheboygan, where the Loves, that uh, trucking place is now, was right near there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they kept the animals out there when they first started their circus. Uh, but then winters were very tough on the animals, so they moved to southern Illinois, and my dad had to move with them. So he spent his first winter with the animals in Illinois, and he loved to dance. My dad was a dancer. And um, he went to a dance on the weekend. This was in La Salle, Illinois. And um, he saw my mom and he said, that's it. She had black curly hair and big blue eyes. And he said, that's the one. So they danced all night. And three months later, they were married. Uh, she had never seen a circus in her life. And uh, she said, oh boy, I don't know what I got myself into. When he, he took her to winter quarters when they started teaching her all the different stuff she had to learn. Um, so she worked with the elephants. Um, this is her picture right here. This, uh, this elephant's name is Lucy, and the gentleman with her is Clowder Kloss from Sheboygan. Uh, he took care of the family owned three elephants. Um, <clears throat> but uh, mom loved the elephants. She was good on horseback. She did all the aerial numbers. She did eight numbers in the show. Um, so everybody did double duty, so my grandpa didn't have to pay so much money. <laughs> <laughs> they also employed a lot of Sheboygan people. And that's where the Turners comes in here in Sheboygan. After my grandfather's circus came off the road, and by the way, they were on the road 18 years, and to be on the road with these trucks in the 30s, with the roads they had, it was tough, tough going. 
Uh, if it rained, it was washouts, and that was another good reason for the elephants, because if it wasn't for them, they wouldn't be, you know, pull everybody out of the mud. They'd hook them up, and the elephants had nothing to it. They could just, you know, run off with them. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so when, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm going to take a drink. I've been talking too much beforehand. <laughs> Anyway, um, when they uh, came off the road then, uh, my mother and my dad and uh, my grandfather, they stayed on the road. Everybody else came home to Sheboygan. And some of the people that were employed, that were performers, Harry Martin is one of them, um, they actually joined the Turners also and started teaching circus acts to people. And that's how the circus act started here in Sheboygan. So in the 30s, a lot of uh, the local people from Sheboygan ended up being circus performers. Now, a lot of you know the names, the Lang family. You know, there was, there's just so many different families from Sheboygan that ran through the, excuse me, the Turners, the Fleck family. Um, there's just, just so many, I, you know, I, um, it was, Sheboygan was a big circus town through those years. And uh, everybody went out in the summertime, and then they would come back to Sheboygan in the wintertime. Um, <clears throat> now, my brothers and my brother, uh, there's a picture of the three of us over on that wall on the right side in the center. That's my brother Pete and my sister Shirley and myself. Um, my sister Shirley was raised on Sel Sterling. She was born, she was 19 years older than I am. I never got to see all this. I was born later. And um, which, and I've heard all the stories, of course, um, uh, from everybody. That's all I ever heard at home was circus from the time I was born. And um, my dad taught me to tumble when I was five or six years old. Um, he set up a thing in the basement, and the belt that you wear is called a mechanic, and, and two ropes on the side, and they had mats all along the basement floor and that's how I learned to tumble. So by the time I was six I was doing round all flip flops, I was doing all kinds of stuff. Which I loved and again um, that's all I heard. So that's really all I knew. And we went to visit every circus that ever came. In fact my sister Shirley, after Sel Sterling, she went with Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey and she was actually featured uh, one of the featured performers with Ringling Brothers Circus. And uh, she was uh, imagine an eighteen year old kid she opened in Madison Square Garden on a big elephant called Modoc, a very famous, famous elephant. She said it was like riding on a coffee table. His head was so big. Uh, but what a thrill to, you know, be from Sheboygan and open in Madison Square Garden. Anyway, as I started getting five, six, seven years old, I wanted to be in the circus also because that's all I knew. And my mom, eh, she wasn't so thrilled about it. Um, but my sister, uh, after the Ringley show, she went to a circus called Algy Kelly Miller Brothers. And it was owned by uh, a gentleman by the name of Obert Miller and his two sons, Dory and Isla. And, or Dory and Kelly, I'm sorry. And uh, they started their circus and they actually worked for my grandfather in the 30s. So we were family friends our whole lives. So when they had their circus, then my sister went over there, and she actually married the head elephant man on the circus. Now, L. G. Kelly Miller, brothers, Mr. Miller loved animals of all kinds. They had 30 horses, and they had 20 elephants. Um, it's just such a wonderful sight. I used to love to go in the elephant barn and see all 20 of them all in there. And they all looked different. To you, they all look alike, I'm sure. These were all uh, Indian elephants. And um, the African elephants have the great big ears. But they have a different temperament than the Indian elephant does. So you won't, you'll very seldom will see an African elephant performing. Um, they're all right when they're teenagers, but as they get older, <laughs> they're a little tougher. So um, you will mostly always see an Indian elephant and mostly females. Very few males on a circus, because males go through what they call musk. And that's breeding time. So they go a little bit nuts. And, <laughs> 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 and it's not fun having one male and 20 females. <laughs> um, so 
you, the, that's the reason you very seldom will see a male elephant with the females. Um, when elephants first came to this country 150 years ago, they didn't know much about them. Um, they knew how to feed them, but that was it. Um, as time went on, they found out they were susceptible to for many different things. Uh, they can get TB, they can get intestinal problems. They have terrible amount of trouble with their feet. Um, they're very padded and they're very sensitive. And when they walk, they are very careful where they walk and what they do. Um, so their feet need a lot of attention. People don't realize that and they sweat through their toenails. They don't sweat like normal animals do. They have little, um, between their toes I should say, they have uh, little veins and that's where they sweat. Plus their ears, why they have the big ears? They've got thousands of uh, veins in their ears and when they do this, that cools the blood in their ears and then that blood gets circulated through their body and that's how they keep themselves cool. Also, they love to be in the water and oh boy, do they love the water. Um, and they like mud, and if you'll see, a lot of times you'll see on the nature shows, the elephants are throwing mud and dirt up on their backs. They do that for a reason. They can get sunburned. That thick skin can have a lot of problems, and to protect themselves, they'd often, if they head for water, then they'll roll in the dirt, and that keeps their backs and, uh, from getting sunburned. So uh, it's important they have a bath, too. They love their baths. Um, they'd line up and they just couldn't wait and they lay down and they just love it, you know, and you would actually scrub them with a scrub brush uh, <laughs> to get, get them all clean. So I love to go down to the elephant bar and watch all what was going on. Uh, on days they, uh, they had foot care, they actually took nail files and they would file their toenails. It's like horses, they can't let them grow out, otherwise they have trouble walking. Um, also their skin around their face, a lot of people will look at the elephants and see those dark circles around their eyes, have you noticed when you see pictures of it? Um, some people say, oh the poor things are sick, you know, they had nothing to do with it, they oil their eyes, their skin around their eyes are very, very, very dry. And so they are always oiled and they always look darker when you, when you see them, you know, so there's nothing wrong with them when you, when you see, see those dark circles. Anyway, um, I finally convinced my mom that I wanted to be on the circus. So my sister was married to the elephant man and she was glad to have me come. So for two summers, I just was on the circus. I didn't stay the whole year or anything. But after that, I thought, oh no, I want to stay, I want to perform, I want to be like everybody else. So uh, they finally decided, okay, I could go and try it. So I had to go to winter quarters. And the winter quarters for Algie Kelly Miller Brothers was in Hugo, Oklahoma. And in fact, it's still there. Uh, the circus is still in Hugo, Oklahoma. They were there in the 40s. And it's just a tiny little town near the border of Texas, uh, about 25 miles from Paris, Texas. Um, the Winter Quarters is kind of a fun place. Um, it was a place for people to come when, when they were off the road. The season is usually from April to October. And then from October on, you went into Winter Quarters. But all the people that worked in the circus, they went home to their homes all over the country. But my sister couldn't do that because my brother-in-law was in charge of the elephants. So we lived in winter quarters. Um, <clears throat> winter quarters was kind of a busy place. That's where they fixed trucks for the next year. Performers learned new acts. Um, there was a lot going on in winter quarters. And like I said, we had to live there, so I lived right there. They enrolled me in school. Uh, it was Ben Franklin School, and I'll never forget my first teacher, it was Mr. Perkins, and they all kidded me about my accent. Well, I couldn't understand any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and they were laughing at me, because I talk so funny, you know. Uh, but it was but a few months that I was talking just like them. You fall right, right into that. Anyway, Mr. Perkins was a wonderful man, a uh, big, kind of robust, man with red hair, graying a little bit, and he had a big pimple on his nose. But <laughs> he, was, he was just the nicest man. Um, Hugo, Oklahoma liked the show people there. They brought a lot of business into their little town. Uh, and Mr. Miller, through the years, has contributed to the school system there in Hugo. He, uh, the last thing he did before he, he died, he actually built a computer room on, for the high school for them. He, they did a lot for the community. It's a pure uh, 
poor community, but very, 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 very nice people. Um, <clears throat> anyway, when I got to Winter Quarters, the first thing I was wanted to do was learn to work with the elephants. Well, my brother-in-law said, well, we're going to just start with one. <laughs> and uh, so they had a big ring barn in, in Hugo and in the Winter Quarters, and you would uh, practice your act. He actually had a ring set up like there would be in the circus. And uh, so he brought in the first elephant, and it, I'm having trouble with this. They brought in the old elephant. Her name was Margaret. And she turned out to be one of my favorite elephants. And she's on all these pictures that I'm around. All these pictures you see that I'm on the elephant, that's Margaret. Now, she was one of the elder statesmen of the herd. She was about 45 years old. Um, she, she just the sweetest thing. And when they brought her in, of course, I was about this tall. And Freddie brought her over to me, you know, and I went, no, <laughs> I'm not quite sure about this yet, you know. But we got acquainted. He brought her in a couple of days, and I just we just visit, and you know, uh, kind of got acquainted with each other. And he said, "Take her trunk." So I took her trunk. And he said, "Blow into it." So I did, and that the the uh, Margaret would recognize me from then on. She had my scent. She had um, <clears throat> a lot of people don't know, but that that. Uh, a lot of people do that. They blow into the trunk and they, they get their scent. But she was, she was wonderful. But anyway, we practiced and we finally, I learned, I learned all the mounts I had to learn. Um, it wasn't easy because I was so little. Uh, and Margaret was very, very big. And uh, most of the, the tricks were like poses. The elephant would sit up on a, what they called the elephant tub. It was round and she would sit up and then I'd go underneath her and just stand there. Or we dance. Uh, Margaret could, she did a little shuffle up on the tub, and then I would dance along the next side of her. And then there were the mounts, though, that were, you had to get up on their head. That was hard. Um, where is that one? I gotta see which one I had. There's one where I'm on sitting on her head. I think it must be over there. Um, anyway, to learn to do that, you, she has to lay down on her side. And once they lay down, it's hard for them to get up. So they kick one foot like we do sometimes to get, you know, to kind of get a start. Well, I had to lay down on the side of her, and she has a harness on her head, and I held on to that harness. Now, Freddie kept saying, now, when she starts to move, you, you, hold, you hold back. Go back as far as you could. Don't go forward with her. Go push, push back. Uh, okay, okay. So the well, first time she lays down, she gives a kick, and I'm hanging on, and boy, we flew. I w it was like a slingshot. I went right over her, <laughs> right over her head in a heap. And uh, my brother-in-law came over, and he looked at me and said, lesson learned. <laughs> and, uh, and I did. Uh, but anyway, it went, went real good after that. Um, I just love working with the elephants. Um, I d and in fact, the first year I was on the road, we didn't stay in the trailer. They fixed a compartment in front of one of the elephant trucks. And it was pretty, it was small, but it was comfortable. And uh, um, the elephants were uh, picketed between the trucks. So at night, when I go to bed, it was wonderful at night. Uh, that was my favorite time anyway uh, on the show. Uh, you could hear the elephants talking and chirping to each other. It isn't that bellowing like you see in the movies. They kind of gurgle and they chirp and they uh, they understand. They talk to each other, and that went on all night, almost all night long. And the truck would move once in a while if they moved. You know, it was just a wonderful way to go to sleep at night. Also, at late at night, the light plant was on all day to keep electricity uh, going and. Uh, at night, after everything was done and over the last show at night, um, <clears throat> the light plant was turned off. Well, then you could hear all the wonderful sounds. Uh, the lions would be roaring, and like I said, the elephants would be talking. Um, the polar bear, she'd be jumping in her cage like this. Uh, in the wild, they break ice, so they jump and they do this, and she'd often do that then. She had an air-conditioned cage. She's the only thing that had air conditioning on the show <laughs> was, was the polar bear. She was pretty comfortable. They actually had an ad with Frigidaire for air conditioning, and they had a special Frigidaire. had a beautiful, beautiful wagon made for her. And uh, she was quite comfortable, but you'd hear her at night. She'd be, she'd be jumping. Um, <clears throat> so it was just kind of comforting sounds to go to sleep at night with. 
it was hard when I finally came off the road to go to sleep at night um, to hear cars whizzing by, you know. It was just, it took quite a while to adjust to that. But anyway, um, I ended up uh, being on the road with my sister for quite a few years. Uh, my day would start, our days would start about 4.30, 5.30 in the morning. We moved every day, a different town, every day, and put it up, took it down. It was a well-greased uh, machine, believe me. It had to be or would have never been able to do all that. And um, so we'd get up at 4.30 or 5.30, depending on how far our jump was. And the jump was how many miles to the next town. Um, <clears throat> I rode with my sister, and my job was to watch for the arrows. And if you wonder what the arrows are, that's how the whole circus moved from one town to the other. A uh, 24-hour man would go ahead of the circus, and he would put up arrows. And every circus had their own kind of arrow and their own color arrow. And it really sounds stupid, but it worked. Um, he would put arrows on every telephone pole, you know, from town to town, and that's how we followed. We got from one town to the other just by following the arrows. Once in a while, you'd blow the arrows, which wasn't so much fun because half the time we didn't know where we were, what day it was. This was in the 50s. There was no cell phones, no TV. There was no, you know, no nothing, really. So you were kind of on your own. And I remember one day, <coughs> We, when we had the trailer and not the compartment, my sister made a wrong turn. I made her do the wrong turn. And we got down a one-way street with a 45-foot trailer. Narrow street, little church at the end of the, tr uh, the street. This is a true story. And this was a Sunday. Um, Sunday was our day off. We only had one show instead of two. That was our day off. So after the matinee, we would often go to the next town. That way we could get a motel room and stay in a, you know, a motel room instead of uh, the cold bucket baths we always had to take you know, on, on the road. Uh, anyway, we get down this, this street and she's got this big trailer. Now what are we going to do? And I, I mean, I'm a kid. What am I going to do? Um, they're singing away in church. It was so pretty. The windows were open. We could hear them, you know. So Shirley said, hang on. So she gunned it, and we went, we went tearing around the churchyard, you know, <laughs> making all kinds of racket, and, and we buzzed around and got back, back and found the arrows again. But you never knew what was going to happen from one day to the next. <clears throat> but the arrows were good. Um, also on a circus, um, Every two weeks, you got a route card. And this is actually a route card from Cell Sterling, my grandpa's circus. And I was going through my pictures the other day, and I found this. And my grandma's had a note on the back of it. I hadn't seen her writing in years and years, so I was thrilled to get it. But I made a copy so you can kind of see. It's usually the route was two weeks where you were going to go and what town you were going to be in and how many miles it was to go from one end to the other. Um, <clears throat> So uh, that's the only way we knew where we were going to be. <laughs> also, you would send this home to your family. So if they wanted to write letters, they would write ahead two weeks and say, hold for the circus. So that's how we got our mail. If anything bad happened at home, the only way they could get a hold of us is if they would call the police department or something like that to come out to the lot and get us and tell us you know, if there, something bad had happened at home. So that was really the only communication we had. Um, so this route card was very important. Because um, like I said, some days we didn't know where we were, what day it was. <laughs> uh, you know, when you just, it, it seems to run together one day after another. You know, so um, it, it, it just was so much fun though. And we had a lot of kids on the circus and we all performed in the show. And once a year, we all uh, got together, the kids, and we put on what we call a kids show. And it, we all had to learn a new act for the show. And then we would perform f for the performers. They, and we had the band played, we had our own music, and uh, everybody had to learn to work, work a new act. Mine was I learned to work with three elephants instead of one, um, which was very exciting. Uh, my sister Shirley and her husband, though, actually had a wonderful, what they called the five act. And they were, the five elephants were teen teenagers, so they were two ton instead of four ton. And it really was 
uh, an act that was very much in demand. In the winter time, uh, when they were at winter quarters, uh, the big shrine circuses all over the United States had shrine shows for the kids for their shrine hospitals, and they were in big arenas. So they would hire circus acts from different uh, places, and then you would perform there for a week or two. Now, I remember one year we were going to St. Louis, and, and we also went to St. Paul, Houston, Fort Worth. Um, so they had a special truck made that five elephants would fit in. And we had to drive the elephants. And so we, uh, they got a hold of us and said, this year we're doing something different in St. Louis. We're going to do strobe light. And so Freddie said, well, what the heck is that? You know? And he said, well, everything is going to be in color. And when you turn the lights out, everything's going to glow. And we want the elephants to glow also. And my brother-in-law said, no, I don't think so. He said, um, their skin is kind of touchy. He said he didn't want to you know, put anything on him. So they kept it up. And finally, they said, well, let's take a patch to us. So they sent the stuff down, and they did a patch on one of the elephant's legs. And they waited a couple of weeks, and it was fine. And it was a vegetable kind of base. So OK, here we go. We've got five elephants, one pink, one green, <laughs> one blue, one yellow. And a, <laughs> Uh, they really looked pretty cute, but uh, <clears throat> so we had, uh, it was a nine hour drive, which is a long time for the elephants to be in the truck. But like I said, these were teenagers, they were smaller, so they filled the truck with hay, which they love, um, and two in the front, one in the center, and two in the back. So fine, we're loaded up, we got colored elephants. Uh, <laughs> my my brother-in-law and his help were in the big truck. My sister and I followed back with the car. So we're on our way, and all, pretty soon we're going to get into Missouri. Well, you know, the mountains can be pretty high in the Ozarks. And with a truck with five elephants, it's a little hard to get up some of them hills. So what do we do? We unload the colored elephants. <laughs> And uh, my brother-in-law and his help took the truck up, and there in the middle of the road are five elephants, colored, myself and my sister only, in the middle of nowhere. So we're standing there and you know, watching the truck go up, and she's on one end and I'm on the other, and the five are just standing there. you know, And you, they teach them to tail up. So when you see them holding on to, the trunks get them in trouble. They can touch and they can, they, you know, they want to grab everything. And so if you teach them to tail up, they behave. It's like little kids, they have to have some rules. So they're tailed up like this, and we're both on the end. All of a sudden this truck come <laughs> flying by, and he, <laughs> you could just see, he was going pretty fast, and pretty soon whoop, off the side of the road it went. <laughs> The door opened up, and he turned around, and he was, he was staring at us, you know, like, what am I seeing? And he said, I've been driving these hills for 40 years. He said, I'm going to give up drinking. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny. And just then, my brother-in-law yells, tail up. Well, the girls were already tailed up, so Barbara, the head one, she leads around, and we're walking up the hill, one on each side of him, and going up the hill, and that guy just was, he, I, he can, I often thought if he was a drinker, when he went home and told his family what he saw, <laughs> what happened. Um, we had a lot of crazy things happen with the elephants. Uh, another time we were going to St. Paul, and um, the elephants are used to Hugo, Oklahoma, where the climate is better, and it was, this was in the middle of winter. And again, we had the five act in the truck. And things were going good, and we had stopped and watered and fed. And, and uh, they usually route the truck away from weight stations. You can imagine with five elephants, we were, we were not legal. Um, anyway, we get maybe a half hour out of St. Paul, and here's a weight station. Well, they had to stop. So we, oh, we were just dreading it. So we drove in. and. Freddie tried to explain. We were just a half hour out of St. Paul to please just let us go. The heater had gone out on the truck, and we needed to get the animals to the arena. Uh, oh, the guy was nasty. No, oh, who do you think you are? Blah, 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 blah. You know, he says, well, 
I, he says, what am I going to do? You know, he said, well, move them around. Maybe if you change the weight over the axle, it will be better. Well, it's starting to snow. It's cold. Shirley and I are standing on the side. Here's Freddie unloading these poor elephants. Well, two of them didn't get along. Hattie was in front and Jenny was in back. Those two, that's like, the elephants are like people. Some get along and some don't. They didn't, so they always had to be apart. Well, they're unloading these elephants and it's snowing and they're slipping around and then Hattie and Jenny got together and they started to fight. Well, it was some bellering and slipping, and the cops were, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. My sister took me into the station to get away from the commotion. I was sitting there, and one of the officers say, help, help, we got elephants fighting here. <laughs> and then it was dead silence. <laughs> Just dead silence, and pretty soon, pardon my English, it comes back on, what the hell are you guys drinking? <laughs> Finally, Freddie, he came in. He said, they told us, just, just the load and go and get out of here. <laughs> so we did. And we made it to, uh, to St. Paul just fine. Everything was fine. Um, sometimes bringing the elephants into the arenas was hard. They weren't used to that. They were used to being on the road in the tent. And, and inside a building is completely different for them. And uh, another time we were in St. Louis, and uh, we were bringing the five down into the into the building. And like I said, they're careful that it was going downhill. And a working guy had a pile of lumber on his shoulder. And so we're coming in, you know, nice, everything going good. We got him out of the truck and they were okay. And he takes that load of lumber and he drops it on the cement floor. Well, elephants uh, spook real easy. Well, Barbara had been known to run anyway. She decided, I'm not staying here. So she turns around, and of course the rest of the herd followed her. Out they went. We're chasing elephants downtown St. Louis. <laughs> and it took, it took two hours to catch them. Um, uh, one had wash on her head. Where she was, we, we, have, we have no idea. <laughs> but, but it wasn't always that way, honest. But, but when you're working with animals and wild animals, things are going to happen, you know. And Barbara was known, she was kind of skittish. And um, one other time she ran, and it really wasn't too funny. It could have been very, very dangerous. Um, I'm going to show you this picture. It's going to be hard to see. I'm going to put some other ones over there. When you're done, you can see. We were playing in Sauk Prairie, Wisconsin. And we were next to a cornfield. Well, Barbara decided, that looks pretty good to me. <laughs> so off she went into the cornfield, all, you know. And uh, so the other ones didn't follow. I don't know why, but Barbara, she headed in there. And uh, then the news got out that the elephant was away from the circus. Well, town people came. They had brooms and shovels, and they started to chase her to get her out of the cornfield. Well, she was terrified. Well, there was a nursing home right next to the, on the outskirts of the town, and she was so scared. This is, I know it's hard to see, but you can, I'll put them over there and you can see. This is the nursing home. It had a big plate glass window. She thought it was open and she went through it. Well, thank God it was at noon because all the people were in eating. Otherwise, they'd have been in the hall in their wheelchairs. She was terrified. She ran down the whole length of the nursing home, took the whole ceiling out with her, and went out the other end. Well, my brother-in-law uh, took Tina then. That was another one of the big ones, her herd mate, and was waiting on the other side. And then they got her, and they took her back to something. To but with an animal, you never know what's going to happen. And people didn't understand. You don't run after an elephant with a, a, a rake or a broom. Yeah you know, not knowing what was going on. So that's just a few of the things that, <laughs> that could happen. Um, most of the time, life was pretty, pretty easy. We'd get up at 4.30 in the morning, like I said, and go to the next town, uh, set up. Uh, we would have to wait for water, but the animals were all watered first, so we had to wait for our water. And it was important, because that's the only water we got. 
Um, so everybody had like eight, nine buckets of water and that we would, they would be all filled up in the morning. So we would clean the trailer or the compartment, whatever we were in that year. Um, we would sew wardrobe. Um, there was always a lot to do. Now there were two shows, two and eight o'clock at night. And um, <clears throat> about 11 o'clock or so, people were starting to get hungry. And the cookhouse usually got there first and they furnished food for people on the show. A lot of the working men just had compartments. They didn't have trailers. Like we could cook in our trailer and stuff. Um, so about 11 o'clock, people start looking for the flag and uh, the cookhouse would put up a flag. There was a high pole. And once that flag went up, then it was time to eat dinner. So everybody into the cookhouse, you know. Uh, one side was the cookhouse. The other side was what's called a pie car. I know it sounds stupid, but it's a sh like a short order restaurant. They could get Cokes or sodas or a sandwich or something to fill in between if you couldn't eat in the cookhouse. Um, the cookhouse food was furnished. It was free. Also, your gasoline was furnished. They gassed you up. Uh, you didn't have to buy your own gas. Um, but the cookhouse was a special, you know, a, a special place. Everybody kind of gathered there at noon. But once you were done eating, then it was time to get ready, ready for the show. Um, so uh, the gals, of course, would be putting on makeup and picking out their wardrobe and stuff. Um, <clears throat> all of a sudden, you would hear somebody yell, doors! And then they would yell that all through the big top, all the people that were selling tickets. We knew we had just a short time to get ready for the show, so that was like our clock. And then about 15 minutes before the show, the trumpet player would come up from the band and he'd play a little riff, the same thing all the time. And that meant you better be ready for the show. So anyway, at 2 o'clock, we worked that show. And it's about two hours long. Um, then at the end, again, everybody was waiting for the cookhouse for supper at night and waiting for the flag to come up. Um, then it was time to get ready for the night show. And I always enjoyed the nights much, much better. Uh, we had full houses or what the show would call a straw house, meant it was a full house. Um, and if it was so full, they'd put straw down for people to sit, you know, if they had to sit on the ground. So that's why it was called a straw house. Um, anyway, um, everybody wore their best wardrobe, their most sparkly stuff because of all the lights. Uh, we usually had a full house because people in the afternoon, the men were working, the nights were always much fuller at night. So it was really nice. Um, I really loved the nighttime shows. Uh, by 10 o'clock, we were done again. Uh, then it meant we had to put it all away, <laughs> uh, which was another very big job. Uh, the prop people went into the big top, and you could just hear all the slapping, all the seats going down. They were loading the seats, all the ring curves, all the props. There was a lot of stuff, and then the canvas um, had to be rolled. But before they could do that, the elephants brought the canvas down at night. And I think that was my favorite part. I'd sit behind the trailer at night and it was getting quieter and the elephants would be pulling one side down and then the other and the air would kind of gather under the big top. It was really pretty to watch this quiet all come, come down again. It was really a really nice, nice feeling. Um, anyway, then the canvas is all rolled up again and everything put away and then you would start over and do the whole thing all over again. Uh, um, those were really some of the really happiest years of my life. Um, I did have a fall, uh, but it wasn't performing. I did three aerial acts besides working with the elephants. I had a fast change between numbers, about four minutes, and it was raining. <clears throat> and we wear on our feet, they call, they're called slop shoes. And actually, it was to keep your feet clean and dry off the muddy lots. Um, and I had those big high shoes on and with my costume and I'm hurrying out and I went off the top step and hit the bottom just as hard as I could. Well, at first it seemed okay, but little by little it got worse and worse and worse and finally I couldn't work anymore. Um, they brought me home and um, I saw Dr. Van Driest. Uh, and in the 50s, back surgery was quite a thing to have. And I was so young, they were afraid to do the surgery on me. Um, so they decided to put me in a body cast. I was in a cast from here to here, uh, weighed 30 pounds. Now, it wasn't much fun being, being a teenager, and I got this 30-pound cast on and wearing maternity clothes. <laughs> you know, and then coming off a circus, and she had her ears pierced. Oh, boy! <laughs> 
the old tongues were wagging. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, they, they changed the cast a couple times in between, and they were hoping once the cast was off that I was realigned, and things would be all right. By the time they took it off, uh, a week later, I couldn't walk again. So I ended up having a fusion, and I had three slip discs. Yeah, all of that from hitting one step, you know, from a fall. And, and as young as I was, you wouldn't have thought that. And as limber as I was, you know, cause I could do 100 chin-ups. I mean, I was in good shape. Um, so anyway, that kind of brought my, my circus career to an end. Um, it was nine wonderful years. Um, I'd do it again if I could. Um, and, and, but I still keep in touch with a lot of circus friends. Uh, I go to Baraboo. And uh, some old timers are still there. And um, I know a lot of the people at Baraboo at Circus World Museum, which, by the way, has a wonderful circus under a big top, just a wonderful. In fact, the gentleman that has the elephants there is, I used to babysit him, Armando <laughs> Noyle. <laughs> and um, so for the last few years, we've been going over there a lot. <laughs> and this year, I had the pleasure, I got a phone call uh, from Baraboo, and they asked me if I would like to be in the circus parade this year. Oh, so uh, I can't tell you what I'm going to be doing, but it's going to be pretty nice. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, the parade is June 25th, and it's actually the old circus parade, like was in Milwaukee, not quite as big. They can't afford to bring all the wagons and animals and stuff into Milwaukee anymore, and there's no help. So um, everything's right there in Baraboo. So in June, they're going to have the big circus parade. And um, I hope some of you can get to see it. That's it. Um, now we'll have some questions and answers, if there are any questions. Yes? Did you ever have trouble with fire with the tent? Well, that's another whole story. My sister Shirley was on Ringling Brothers when the terrible Hartford fire was. 163 people died. Now, this was in the 40s, and to waterproof the tents, they had w wax on them. Um, and there were no smoking regulations in those years. Um, my sister had just gotten back to the show um, <clears throat> that day, uh, no, two days before the terrible fire. Somebody, they still don't know for sure exactly, they're still arguing over it. Somebody had flicked a cigarette. It started the sidewall on fire, and of course it spread like wildfire because of the wax on top of the canvas of the tent, you can imagine. Now, w the show was going on, and Mae Koval, who was a wonderful animal lion trainer, and she was in the ring with her lions while this was going on. And the lions are brought in on small shoots. They're about this wide and maybe that long, and that's just to get them in the big top. So they were lined up. So they were actually blocking uh, a way to get out. And of course, people um, were panicking because it went up just terrible. It was just terrible. Everybody was running with buckets of water. Um, Emmett Kelly, the famous clown, he was throwing water, but it was going to do no good. It just, it just went. So anyway, over 160 people died. So that's why now if you see a circus, the Lion Act is either opens the show or it closes the show. It's never that the shoots are in there during the performance, so nothing is ever blocked again. That changed. And of course, all the regulations later in life, things, you know, change that are, are better. You can't smoke in the big top, you know, that kind of stuff. Any other questions? Judy. Tell you the story about the Miller funeral. Oh, um, that was a wonderful experience. The, the Miller family that owned the circus I worked for, um, Mr. Miller was, like I said, he loved animals, and he just was a, a showman showman and very well thought of. Um, his daughter, Barbara, who was my friend, grew up, and she ended up running the circus as he got older. Well, he passed away, and um, we all got word that Mr. Miller had passed away, and of course we wanted to go to his funeral. We knew it was going to be something spectacular. Uh, so a couple friends of mine from Baraboo, we went down for the funeral. And we got there, and in Hugo, the schools were closed for the funeral. That's how much they thought of Mr. Miller. The kids were able to be off of school and come to the funeral. They had the big top set up 
three rings, and in the center ring is Mr. Miller in a candy apple red coffin. <laughs> I mean, it was just, you know, everything he would have wanted, and flower tributes from all over the world. The ring was just solid. And the band was playing all his famous hymns, all the hymns that he liked. It was just something you wouldn't have believed to, to see this. Then, that wasn't enough. Barbara rented three Greyhound buses. And all the elephants they brought up, they had, were all draped in black and gold. And they had howdahs fixed for the top of the elephants. That's a little, like, rack. And it was just covered with flowers hanging down. So here were all these elephants in these black morning outfits with the gold. I mean, it was just, you couldn't believe it to see it. Um, so anyway, we all loaded on these huge Greyhound buses, and they, it was like a parade. And that's what he wanted. And he was actually in a, one of those 1890 hearses with the glass on the sides being pulled by six white horses. Um, then all the animals behind, all draped. And then here come the elephants with their black. I mean, it was just something you would never, ever see in your life again. And they took it down uh, to the cemetery. Mr. Miller bought almost all of the cemetery. And he donated it. And that's for show people when they pass away to be buried together. And it's really something to see. If you go to Hugo, Oklahoma, you have to see the cemetery. It's spectacular. It's all the gravestones are beautiful, big round wheels and tents, and it's just really something to see. But it was really, really an experience to uh, experience that. And then all the kids were lined up all the way down, you know, and waving, and um, it was it was really something quite, quite nice to to experience. Yes. I want to know when the spectacular movie of your experiences is coming. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm having a hard enough time trying to get a book together. Um, you know, what I've just told you tonight, I've just scraped the, the, the top. There's so much more uh, to what went on. And there were more things that happened on a show. Something I really didn't cover was bad weather. Um, if there was a windstorm, uh, that was that was dangerous because we didn't know if we were going to lose the big top or what was going to happen. And I remember we were in Pierre, South Dakota. And <clears throat> the elephants were, the whole line was acting crazy. And uh, we knew something. And you could see off in the distance something was coming. Um, I was in the big top with all my friends. And we were just jumping on the trampoline, just having fun. We were being kids between shows. And all of a sudden, my brother-in-law came running in. And he grabbed me by the arm. And he said, come on, get out of here. I said, what's the matter? You know, he said, just come on. So he took me and he threw me up in one of the elephant trucks. They're very heavy and locked the door. You know, I scrambled up and looked out the little window. And just as I looked, the whole big top blew over. The whole thing, um, the t it was in shreds. Um, my sister got hit by a quarter pole from the, she was putting her dogs in the car. She ended up in the hospital there for a week. Um, so then what do you do? Your big top is a mess. What are you going to do? So you show outside without a top. And that's what we did for a, almost a month. We showed outside in that heat up in North Dakota and South Dakota and Montana and Wyoming. Um, <clears throat> and actually, the performers and all the help sewed the thing together again. We had a sailmaker that was on the circus who took care of the canvas. But of course, he couldn't do all of that. So even us kids learn how to use the big needle with the stuff and the wax, and everybody sewed. And by golly, in a month, we had it back together again. So we were under canvas again. But you were, you never knew what was going to happen next, you know, on a show. But majority of the time, things were good. Um, rainy days were hard because of the muddy lots, and the elephants would pull us on and pull us off again. Um, so a lot of experience, but um, I, I just had a wonderful childhood. Um, I think I'm more liberal because of the upbringing I had. I worked with so many different kinds of people. You know, I, I worked with Mexican people. I worked with Chinese people. I worked with gay people. I worked with, you know, everybody had a job to do. You all worked together, and there was no trouble. You know, it's really hard nowadays sometimes to hear all the stuff that's going on. So 
Um, <clears throat> that was kind of hard for me when I came back to Sheboygan because Sheboygan was a very conservative, and there's nothing wrong with that, I don't mean that. But a black person couldn't even sleep in Sheboygan until the 1960s. You know, so um, I had to keep my mouth shut. Uh, <laughs> and, and after all of that with my back and school was a mess and I finally got back into school and um, I didn't have many friends at all. You know, where do I start? And um, thank goodness, and most of them are here tonight, <laughs> I found a really wonderful bunch of gals that just kind of took me in and we've been friends ever since. Love you all. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, anyway, any more questions? Carol. Sonia, are there any Lindemans that are still involved in the circus or in any way, shape, or form? None. I'm it. I'm the last. My sister passed away a couple years ago. My brother Pete also passed away, and my brother Bill died young. He, my youngest brother, was on Clay at Beatty Circus for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for a while. But he had diabetes really bad, and so he, he wasn't a performer. He didn't really, um, you know, join in as much. But um, no, they're all gone. Everybody's gone. It ended with me. It ended with me. Um, but like I said, I keep touch of all my old friends yet from show business. And uh, in fact, in July, I'll be going to Florida, and I'll be going to Sarasota for a few days, and I'll get to see a lot of the, my old friends. And Facebook it keeps it all alive for me, and I have a wonderful family. My daughter's here tonight. My grandson and his wife are here tonight. Um, hello. <laughs> Hi. I wanted to come over and meet since I'm one of your cousins on the Miller side. Too, oh, you so are. Oh. My, my mom is Cindy McInerney. Oh, I know Cindy. My grandma is Beatrice Knievers. Oh, how wonderful. Some more circus people. <laughs> 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 Any more questions? Judy. So uh, to everyone when you did the ropes and what that's called and, and what that was all about. Oh, the aerial acts yeah. I did? Okay, one was called what, uh, Spanish Web, and that's it over there. Um, I'm on the rope upside down <laughs> by my leg, and that's high in the air. Um, there's actually, after you're done, if you want to look in the circus room, there's a, it's called Sp <laughs> Spanish Web, and that was an aerial act. You would climb way up, and there was a, like a loop at the top, and you put your hand or your foot in, and then you did tricks. And somebody held the rope tight or loose, depending on what you were doing. The web sitter was very important. Uh, I wasn't so important, but the web sitter was. Uh, my brother actually sat my web for quite a few years, and it got to be kind of a joke. He'd see how fast he could spin me at the end <laughs> to see if he could make me dizzy. So one, I probably shouldn't even be telling this. Uh, so I had a costume on, and he was spinning me, and I was really getting dizzy, and my elastic broke. Um, <laughs> on the top of this, which he didn't see. So I'm flying around, and my top is flying around. <laughs> <laughs> and when we finally stopped, I'm like this, and you try to get your foot out of a foot loop upside down, yeah. hold yourself, and crawl down. <laughs> well, by the time I got down, I was so dizzy. Um, I styled, and what they call style is, you know, when they, when they, when they do all this stuff, you know. Uh, I did it to the back of the crowd and since I was so dizzy. Um, but uh, it was just fun having, you know, my brother with me. It was just that kind of stuff that went on all the time. And then I did swinging ladder, and that, there's a ladder in the circus room, too. When you're done, you're welcome to go peek in there. Um, and that was an aerial act, too. And then I also did cloud swing, and that was another aerial act with a long rope that went this way with loops. And it was fun. And then he'd swing me, too, and on days when the tops, the top of the canvas was muddy, he'd swing me so high so I'd hit it, you know, and then all that dirt would fly, fly, fly at me. He thought that was so funny. <laughs> so we were taking baths all the time. And... Uh, and another time uh, when I worked with the elephant, uh, we did an act, and um, she would walk over me. I had to lay under her. And she would walk over me and then come around and then lay down this way on top of me. Well, there's a lot of room under here. I could just, when she came down, I could just wiggle, you know. Um, but sometimes, um, with the elephants before the performance, they would stand them up to make them go to the bathroom. And because it was heavy, they would, that was normal. Before a performance, the elephants, they would stand up, and that's how they would 
make them get rid of what they had, and it was usually a lot. Um, anyway, a um, couple times it happened. Um, she would let loose, and there I was. <laughs> And what choice did you have? I'd just get up in style and smile like nothing happened <laughs> and beat it to the trailer to take a bath. <laughs> but that was just part of everyday, everyday life on the circus. Any more questions? What acts did your sister do? Uh, my sister Shirley was really, really, she was a big star. Um, she actually uh, did heel and toe catches swinging. Now a lot of people did heel and toe catches would hang on a trapeze bar, but she did hers swinging. And um, she actually would swing to the front really fast. She's like this on the bar and when you sw it's all timing. And when she got out to the front, she'd leap out and catch by her heels. She, she, uh, she really was a, a big star. And Shirley was a kind of a sad situation because she was performing for so many years, 35 years, and when she had to come off the road, it wasn't easy for her. She wasn't happy. She didn't do well. Um, she, uh, I was maybe the lucky one because I made my friends. You know, I, I established things. She didn't have girlfriends. She didn't have, she didn't know how to be with towners. That's what everybody would call people that weren't in show business, you know. She never got over being off the road, so it wasn't good for her for many years. She had a hard time just getting along. Well, she had a sad life with her children. Yeah, there was a lot, lot yeah. went on there. There was a suicide, well, anyway, it, she had some sad times. So anyway, um, I, I ended up much better. Now, you mentioned that circus fire before. There's two excellent books out. If anybody wants to look them up online, one was called uh, The Day the Clowns Cried. Cried, yes. And the other one is just called Circus Fire. Yeah. And there was one little girl that they identified most everybody from that circus fire in the Ringling Show, but one little girl, they called her Little Miss No Name. Nobody came forward to claim her. Um, and they couldn't figure it out. Well, the people in Hartford uh, felt terrible, and they actually had a grave for her, uh, gave her a marker. Um, uh, the whole business. And finally, about 10 years ago or so, they figured out it was, her parents died in the fire, uh, lost the whole thing. And uh, so it was, a, it was a very, very sad, sad day for the circus, very sad. And that was one of the worst things that's ever happened. Anyway, Judy? Yeah, explain um, the back door and when the circus starts and everybody comes out and goes around the ring. Oh, okay. Well, the beginning of the show, uh, the first number usually that a circus opens, it's called spec, and that's short for spectacular. And the only thing it is is everybody that's going to perform in the show, uh, and there's usually a theme, like coming to America or Disneyland or something. It's uh, Everybody's in costumes from that theme. That just gives everybody a chance to see everybody that's going to be in the show and all the animals. So the elephants, you know, were all decorated and the girls would be riding them and they would come in too. And the back door is where the, all the performers would come in and the front door is where the people that bought tickets came in. So the back door was for the performers and the front door was for people when they came in, came into the circus. Any other? Just one quick question yeah. about Shirley. Yeah. I'm going to mention Boston. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my, uh, Boston was very, very conservative. And when my sister opened uh, with Ringling Brothers in Madison Square Garden, Boston was the next town. And <clears throat> my sister, um, well, how can I say this? John Ringling North actually picked her to open. and. Uh, she kept asking about her costume. Where's her costume? You know, and she needed to be fitted and all this and that. And then she said one day she got an envelope in the mail. It was this big. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, nowadays it'd be nothing. It was, you know, it was like a, a 50s bathing suit. But then, that was pretty racy. And she was actually banned in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> They wouldn't let her ride. And she was so mad because she had a ride on a float with Emmett Kelly. If you can imagine being mad that you had a ride with Emmett Kelly uh, <laughs> on a thing that, um, yeah, she was banned in Boston. And in fact, uh, her and Emmett Kelly were really good friends. And I'm friends with Emmett's daughter now. And we t 
talk back and forth, but my sister was actually a bridesmaid at one of Emmett Kelly's. He was married twice. She was a bridesmaid, and they were married in the big top in the center ring, and uh, she was one of the bridesmaids at Emmett Kelly's uh, wedding. Any other questions? Yes? Not, nothing that I know of. We never took pictures of ourselves, never. The only reason we have pictures is because of the circus fans. And <clears throat> that was a big, big group. And they followed circus from town to town, and they're the ones that take all the pic took all the pictures. Now, they would take them, and they would send them to us for free. Um, I have a 1,000 pictures. And most of them are from circus fans. And through the country, there are clubs uh, that are just love circuses, and they're called tents, not clubs. And Sel Sterling, my grandfather's tent, uh, was lucky enough to have a tent here in Sheboygan, named after him. And there were a lot of members. Um, so each area of the United States had their own tent named after a famous circus family of some kind. In fact, my uh, grandfather and his brothers were inducted into the Circus Hall of Fame in Florida, which was the biggest thrill of their life, uh, because that's kind of the elite of, of show business, to be inducted in the Circus Hall of Fame. Hiccup. Yeah, they, uh, um, the circus fans uh, got together with the state of Wisconsin and they honored South Sterling Circus with a plaque. And it's at the post office here in Sheboygan. A lot of people don't even know it's there. Um, but it's there permanently and it gives a little bit of history about the South Sterling Circus. Well, they timed the dedication of that to when Carson Barnes came here, the circus that used to show there. And that actually was Al G. Kelly Miller, the one I was with. They changed the name, and they showed down here in Sheboygan for 20 years on the lakefront. And we always had big reunions. Oh, we had such a good time. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, the day of the dedication, Mr. Miller said, I'm going to bring them all up. So he brought all the elephants up. From He walked them from down in the lakeshore up to the post office in Sheboygan. They all lined up, and um, that was the background for the picture they took for the paper. We had 20 elephants in Sheboygan. <laughs> yes? How long did your dad uh, perform in the circus, and why would he have discontinued it? Well, my dad, like I said, he had to learn to do everything, and he started from a little tiny guy, and he was actually in his late 30s by the time he retired. Um, but he ended up with an enlarged heart, and it was from all the physical activity. Um, he actually did it to himself for being in such good shape. Um, he was very sad when he had to come off the road. In fact, he tried to go with another circus just to do concessions and stuff, but it wasn't like performing. Um, he only did that one year. But my grandfather, there was no keeping him home. Um, he was on the road until he was in his late 70s in, in different capacities. He was equestrian director. Uh, equestrian director is the man that keeps the show going at, with a whistle, and he'd blow, and then the, the band knew when to stop or when to play or whatever. He ran the show, so he did that for many years. And a lot of years he also was 24-hour man, and that's the man that went ahead of the circus, and uh, he would arrow uh, from town to town, and then he made all the arrangements for the feed and water that that was waiting for all of us when we got into the next town that that was all taken care of. Um, my grandmother lived upstairs from us, and we lived downstairs, and uh, because Grandma was alone a lot, Grandpa was going <laughs> with the circus all the time, he'd come home and visit in the winter. <laughs> but uh, so Grandma lived upstairs from us. so. Any other questions? Yes? Sonia, did you have any other sibling, siblings? Or is this just Shirley and Pete and you? Yeah, were... Yes, it was just the three of us. Um, I actually had a brother, Bill, who was younger than I am. Uh, but he was diabetic, and he didn't do very well. So he never really, uh, he was on, on Clyde Beatty Cold Circus for a while, but he got sick and come home and because of diabetes. So he didn't really. And actually, we had. I had another brother, but he died shortly after he was born. My mother was 45 years old, and um, we had, my mom had Pete after my grandfather, 
and then my brother Bill, that was after my grandpa's other brother, and then she had a little boy, and he was, was Albert, but he didn't make it. They'd have had the three brothers again, but it didn't work out that way. Any other questions? Yes? I was just curious if you knew any stories about the elephants swimming in Lake Michigan. Well, I don't know any stories about Lake Michigan. I'm sure they went down and took them down there, but the water is so cold, um, they wouldn't be in there very long. <laughs> but they loved water, and in fact, a couple times on the road, we were next to a, a pond, and the Barbara again, the troublemaker, she had it, and they all went with her. Well, it took them all day to get them out of the <laughs> out, of, out of the water. They just love it. Um, and uh, like I said, they always look forward to getting their, their baths in the morning and getting scrubbed, and uh, they, they very well behaved. Elephants are very, very smart, very, very smart. Isn't true that they never forget, but they, as a herd, never forget each other. Uh, they can talk to each other up to 10 miles away, and you'll never hear it. Um, that's how sensitive they are. Um, they're a wonderful animal, very, very, very smart. And they're like, a, they're like people. Some you like, some you don't like. Um, <laughs> Tina was kind of grumpy, and you had to be careful with her. Uh, one day I was out, uh, and I came up behind her, um, and it scared her, and she turned like this with her trunk, and she let me have it, and knocked me six foot in the air. <laughs> and then again, my brother-in-law said, lesson learned. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carol. Are there any circuses that are still traveling with elephants? Uh, very few. Uh, in fact, I was just going to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> very few have animals now because of all the commotion with PETA. And if Peter only knew what terrible things they have done, because so many of these animals had to, had to be put down because they can't work no more. Uh, people that love their animals, and there was nothing you can do about it. An uh, elephant eats two to 300 pounds of food a day. You, f you, know, you have to feed it. You have to be able to pay for it. Um, so what's happened in Oklahoma, the Miller family, now the older generation of who I work for is gone, but Barbara, the daughter, um, she has started a foundation in Hugo, Oklahoma. It's called the Endangered Ark. Now they have 20 elephants down there. And what they are doing, um, they're thinking ahead of the game so they can keep the elephants. And they've teamed up with Oklahoma, actually, and it's a tourist de destination. What it is, they have hundreds of acres. And the elephants can roam at will. And, <clears throat> and now they're starting to build cottages. And what they're doing, so and able to keep those animals and pay for their care, uh, they're renting the cottages on weekends. And you can come and rent the cottage, and it's in the middle of where the elephants are. And then they will bring your breakfast and your dinner down to you. Wow. So you can have dinner or breakfast with the elephants. They, they come carrying baskets. And you can actually feed them and interact with them, and then they give you a tour of the property. If the weather's nice, they're just out doing their own thing. Uh, if it's bad, they have a beautiful new building. They actually have showers. They walk through like a car wash. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about they have a really good life. Um, we were, uh, Richard and I were there a couple of years ago, and Richard had never been around that many elephants. and. Uh, we took a tour of the place down there. We went in, and I wish you could have seen his face when we went into the 20 elephants standing there. Um, actually, and then they had a side room, and uh, I asked Barbara what that was, and one of the older elephants, she has arthritis real bad. They're like humans. They get sick. They get old, you know. Um, and they had one, I think she was 65 years old. But she had arthritis real bad, so the room was padded completely, and she was away from the herd, so nobody would bump into her or hurt her. And you know they kept her, and she said it's a hard decision when it's time to put them down. It's hard to part with them when you've had them so long. But most, of, like I said, most of the elephants you see now were born in <coughs> captivity. They don't know what the wild is. You would take them out in the wild, they would die. They're used to humans. They're you know they're used to the interaction. They're smart. They learn things. So anyway, Barbara's thinking ahead of, ahead of the game. So someday when there maybe can't be any performing elephants, and they're going to be extinct someday if people like that don't do something. Uh, the zoos are doing wonderful 
wonderful work now with um, having them uh, having little ones born because for years and years they did not breed in captivity but we didn't know about them and their cycles and stuff and that's why now they know more about it so some of the babies are being born in Hugo now they've had two born oh, and they're adorable we got to see them when we were down there um, <clears throat> but anyway um, Barbara uh, it, it's it's open to anybody that wants to come it's expensive to rent the cottages for the weekend but it's expensive to feed the elephants and uh, they do give you a tour of every place, and you can go to the cemetery to see the showman's rest where all the circus performers are. Um, it's really quite a circus town, it really is. Uh, and it's a tiny little town, and uh, normally you wouldn't pay any attention to it, probably. But it's, it was a, it's a wonderful little community, and it's known as Circus USA. Any more questions? Yes? Uh, well, if they get old, they go to winter quarters then, and they're still taken care of. If they're very ill, of course, they would be put down. Um, the elephants, uh, they're all staying together in Hugo. Some of them that I worked with are still there. Not many, but a uh, few are still there. Um, and they get, like I said, they get sick just like other people. You know, things happen to them. It isn't that they're being mean or whatever. They get ill, too. And they could Oh yeah, they can perform, you know, like Margaret, she was 45, she was still working and happy. She'd come and she'd hear her music, I'd stand with her at the back door and waiting to go in and work and she'd hear her music, she knew it before I did and my head would go down and up I'd go, you know, and away we went. And she loved performing and especially she liked to dance and that I was getting dizzy there also. Um, she'd put me in her trunk and they played a waltz, you know, and then she'd turn really fast. Well, then she'd get going, and we would turn, and we would turn, and we would turn. I'm trying to look decent, you know, uh, but she loved the music. She was just, just a wonderful animal. Um, and like, again, like I said, some were, you know, he had a watch, they were a little bit grumpy. Um, all have different person, and they all look different. All look different. You could look down, I could look down the line, I could tell you every name, you know, Margaret, Jenny, Tina, Kathy, you know, all the way down. You, you, you get to know them all. Anybody else? How old was your brother Pete when he stopped performing? Your brother? My brother Pete? Um, Pete, oh gee. Um, he, I was on the road actually a little longer than he was. Uh, he, but he was on the road before I was. He actually was on a circus with my dad. And I told you, my dad tried one year of being concessions. And uh, that year, Joe, Joe Lewis, the boxer, was on the circus. They traveled with him, the Brown Bomber. And my brother Pete and him got to be very good friends. Um, that was the thrill of his lifetime, to be friends with Joe Lewis. And he was a really a nice man. But <clears throat> Joe had a troubled life. He didn't have much education. And he had white promoters, which really took advantage of him. Uh, when he died, yeah, he was a greeter in Las Vegas. He really had not much left. They had taken most of his most of his money. Um, okay, was, was he married to Ione? Yes, okay. Pete was a mentor. He used to pick me up and take me to work every day. Oh, him. really? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was a long time ago. A long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into that. <laughs> Any other questions anybody have? Yes. No, Armando takes them back to Hugo. That's where they're from, from the circus I was with. And that's why I used to babysit Armando when he was just a little boy. His mother and I were really good friends. They were uh, from a very famous writing act called the uh, Loyal Rapinski, and they were on Ringling Brothers for a lot of years. And then they came, uh, they all split up and got older, and the family came to the Kelly Miller Circus. And uh, uh, his mother's name was Lucy Loyal, and she was a famous bareback rider. But anyway, I used to babysit him while she was working. And now I got to look up at him. Uh, and he's in charge of the herd now in Hugo. And then they bring them up in May, and they will perform in Baraboo uh, from May until the end of August, I believe it is. And he brings three of the girls up. And we call them girls, because they're all female. So when we talk about them, we say girls. Uh, <clears throat> and I think this is the last year, though, that he'll be coming with them. I don't know what they're going to do after this year. He's been here three years in a row. So if you want to see a really wonderful elephant act and the kid I used to babysit for, <laughs> um, they'll be performing this year. So any other questions? Yes? 
This might be before your time, but when your family closed their circus, where did all of their many, many animals and trucks and wagons and... Oh, that's an interesting story. Um, they uh, ended up having, when my grandfather's circus finally broke up after 18 years, they had an auction. And what happened, uh, our very rich man from Sheboygan, the, or, uh, Chicago, his name was King Minus, he came up and he was, it was his idea just to buy a few animals for, to entertain the <coughs> orphanages and stuff like that. He ended up buying almost all the show. <laughs> it was a hard time for the family to see, see that go. My sister especially, because she had uh, a horse buster that she worked with for years. And he had to go with the pony act because he was the lead horse. He had to go. Um, she was crying. I mean, it was a very, very sad day in Sheboygan when they had to have the auction. But they did auction everything off. Um, there is one truck left from Sal Sterling. Um, and I'm going to take this with me. Uh, it's actually pictured on here, this truck here. They found a few years ago, Chappie Fox, who uh, started Circus World Museum, they found it in Ohio in a ditch, uh, in very bad shape. But uh, Chappie said, uh -uh, we got to have it. There's nothing here from Sal Sterling. They really feature Ringling Brothers at, because of Ringling was from Barefoot. But they do have a few things from other circuses there. All my wardrobe I donated there. And we have a circus room here, and I have nothing to give them. <laughs> um, anyway, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting dry. Uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful place in Baraboo. It really is. So if you get a chance to just go in, and uh, the show is wonderful. And they have a, uh, some extra little side shows that are fun. It's a real family show. You, you know, you can take your whole family and have a great day and spend the day there in Baraboo. Judy. In Baraboo, is that very nice young man still able to do his big cats? No. Uh, Ryan, OK, for a couple of years, there was a gentleman there. Um, his name was Ryan. And he didn't actually perform with them, but he shows how to train and what their methods were training. And he had 12 beautiful, beautiful tigers. And you could actually come up and watch, and he'd explain how they uh, took care of them and everything. And that's another, um, I'm glad you mentioned that, because now he is in Hugo, Oklahoma also. And he has partnered with the state of Oklahoma, and he is permanently there with his tigers now. And that's another place you can go to get educated about animals. So he has a permanent home with all his beautiful tigers. Yeah, a couple of years ago, he was actually showing how he did the prints on the canvas. Yep, on I the actually canvas. bought one of those. Oh, did I you? That, yeah. yeah so. Yeah, a lot of people just love that, you know. And, and the cats, they get so, meh, meh. Yeah, he actually had to wrestle with it. It was kind of like, no, give that, me that paw. That's know? kind of a show, yeah. you know, <laughs> got to make it. But when make people it. say they don't treat those animals right, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a Shriner, and I've been. Oh, you know. I, I've seen the backside of when the Shrine Circus was here. And let me tell you, they take care of those animals because they would not do that for those people otherwise. Well, I, what I try to get through people said there's good pet owners and there's bad pet owners. Mm -hmm. That don't mean they're all bad pet owners. 95% of the people love their animals and take care of them. There's always a few bad ones in the bunch and we're not responsible for them. But I can only tell you what I know from my experience. And in the 20, 20 years my brother-in-law was with the elephants, I can honestly say I never saw him leave the lot once. Shirley and I went to the next town he stayed with the animals. And he, he never went to a movie. He, he never did any. He never let them out of his sight. And uh, the, their vets were there. They had their shots. I mean, they're taken care of. Their feet were taken care of. And they had very good care. And like I said, they're used to humans. They're not used to the jungle. Um, so he, there's a very good interaction between the animals and humans. Well, you know how it is with a dog. You love the dog, he loves you. You know, it's no different with other animals. Yes? Um, my husband also was a Shriner. He was uh, one of the Shrine animals. He was Garfield. Oh, from the oh. parades? Yes, and uh, it was Garfield, was it? Well, he was walking in costume to go into the circus, and the, the tigers did not like him. <laughs> <laughs> they did. You've got to go different ways. They, they didn't know his <laughs> smell. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Shrine? It was sort of a different Oh, 
Well, the Shriners did wonderful work, and um, a lot of the Shriners now aren't doing the circuses because of PETA and all the trouble. Um, in fact, I was in Milwaukee at a show, and I went up to one of them that were protesting. One of the kids, he was yelling terrible things. And I said, you know, what, what are you objecting to? And he says, I don't know. Somebody paid me to yell and scream. Yeah. So that shows you how, how, ethical, how ethical some of these people are. I'm not saying there's bad apples. There are, but the majority of them are not. Yes? Uh, I don't, well, <laughs> I could have some made. <laughs> uh, these actually were made uh, here in Sheboygan at the, uh, what is that called, the map uh, where they make Great Lakes, Great Lakes printing. Uh, you can take anything in and they can blow them up any size and very reasonably priced. So <clears throat> I used to do smaller presentations and so these worked really good and I did a lot of senior citizen uh, programs and I found it's easier for people to see these and, you know, uh, it just smacks you in the eye. You can sit and look at slides, that's fine. But I think this has more impact uh, when, you, when you look at them all. If you put a description underneath them, if you would leave them, and put a description as to what some of these are, then it uh, Okay, well most of, most of them, all of those are me. <laughs> <laughs> The one in back, uh, way in back by the cameraman, that's me under the elephant. Yeah, that's, that's Margaret, my buddy. Uh, the next one is me on swing and ladder, and then on my bareback horse, and then that headstand I was telling you about in the corner, the, where it threw me like a shot, that's that picture. And then the picture of my brother, my sister, myself together. I often wondered what my mother thought when she came to visit. My grandfather was on the show, my brother Pete, myself, my sister Shirley, and she'd sit in the audience. I often wondered what she was thinking when she saw all of us performing together. So, anything and else? I think we'll take one more question and then um, we can kind of wrap it up. So you have some time to take a look at the photos and check out the circus exhibit. And I'm sure Sonia will talk more oh, with you. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, if you have any more questions. Michael. How much for an autographed photo? <laughs> <laughs> That's my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this was wonderful. I can't believe how many people showed up and how many wonderful faces that I do know and that I don't know and, and some new ones that I've met on Facebook. It's just been wonderful. I can't tell you this night meant a lot to me. And I want to invite you to look at the circus room. Thank you.